I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, you know how much I love 5-4, which is now Menlo Club. Remember, I've been a member for over two years now, and I love them. Well, I got together with the folks at Menlo Club, and they're offering my listeners a 50% off plus a free pair of 5-4 sunglasses when you sign up in May. Menlo Club is great clothes. They come to your door every month. It's $60. That includes tax. That includes shipping. You get to select your sizes, your styles. It's really super easy. And like I said, the clothes are great. So go to MenloClub.com, sign up, use the promo code FSP, as in Fascination Street Podcast, and you will get 50% off your first month plus a free pair of 5'4 sunglasses. Thanks, guys. What if Michael Jordan played one secret pickup game in summer 1996 to pay off a debt so big it would get him banned from the NBA for life? What if that game was played on a private court in Malta and Jordan's parting gift was a jewel-encrusted pair of Jordan 11s, a pair of kicks so special and rare that they could be worth millions if they actually exist? Follow Jack Palms on a hunt from San Francisco to Hawaii and back across the country to New York City as he tracks the only person who knows the truth about these sneakers, a felon who just skipped his bond to chase them. The mythical pair of sneakers that can only go by one name, the Maltese Jordans. Seth Harwood presents his next novel. Subscribe today at patreon.com slash Seth Harwood. Do you like eating sand? What about talc or titanium dioxide? The fact is, 99% of all vitamins on the market contain unnecessary and potentially toxic additives. That's why we've created Pure Vitamin Club. Our daily multicap is a carefully balanced formulation of the 13 essential vitamins plus 11 key minerals with no added ingredients of any kind. Just the nutrients your body needs to function at its best. But no vitamin will do you any good unless you actually take it. So we've made that easy for you. Pure Vitamin Club will deliver your vitamins to your door for pennies a day. Pure Vitamin Club. Click on the Pure Vitamin Club bottle on the right side of the screen of this podcast webpage to get started. Hey guys, this episode is with Lord Honey Jason Smith, the season 13 winner of the next Food Network star and the host of Food Network's Best Baker in America which returns to the Food Network channel tonight, Monday, May 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Had a lot of fun hanging out with this guy, and make sure you catch the premiere of Season 2 tonight. Enjoy, guys! Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm fantastic. How are you doing? Hello. Honey, I'm as fine as frog hair split four way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you for joining me on Fascination Street. Today we have season 13 winner of the next Food Network star, Jason Smith. My wife and I call him Jason Lord Honey Smith. I'm not sure how he feels about that. So welcome to the show, Jason. Hello, hello, hello. Honey, I feel perfectly fine with that. Everybody calls me Jason Lord Honey, so I'm perfectly fine with that. You can use that as my middle name anytime you want to. (laughs) All right, I appreciate that. I know that you have a a really big day of press today, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Oh, you're welcome anytime. I can work in any minute for anybody. (laughs) Well, that's the uh, Southern gentleman in you, I promise. So... First, let's talk about what got you into cooking. I know that you were born and raised in Kentucky, sort of maybe on a farm. What made you decide to get into cooking? So it's really a neat story. Yes, I was born and raised in in Kentucky on a huge tobacco farm. It all started, I was around six years old, and we all had to pull our part on the farm. And when tobacco season came around, which was late spring and all summer long, the kids, we always we always helped 
set the tobacco, we helped hold the tobacco, we'd pull the plants. If it was anything that the kids could do that was, I won't say extremely hard work, but it was stuff that, that was stuff that we just had to do as a child that we started. So while the adults were doing the other stuff, then we would do all of that. So, and I had had enough of it. I did not want to be out there in those fields of hoeing tobacco. I didn't want a thing to do with it. I thought, I have had enough of this. So I asked Granny one day, I said, because my grandmother and my mom usually stayed in the house, and they would actually um, cook all the meals for everybody that was working through the day. So we would have breakfast, and then everybody would go and work in the field, and then Mom and Granny would work on lunch. And so then we would come in and eat lunch. So I asked Granny one day, I said, can I not stay with you and help you cook? And she said, yes, that'll be fine. You can stay with me today. So when it comes time after breakfast for everybody to go work, she told them all, she said, you all go on, Jason's going to stay and help me today. So from that day on, I just stayed and helped Granny cook pretty much, lunch and supper and snacks in between. And my grandmother seen something in me that nobody else really seen in me at that time. She seen the, the ability and the want to that I had in the drive because I would drive her crazy just when she was making biscuits, even something that simple of saying, can I please do it, can I please do it, can I please do it, until she'd finally say, yes, just just do it so you will hush. But she seen something in me, and, and I thank her for seeing that and allowing me to do that, because if, if not, I may not be where I'm at today. That's a wonderful story. My wife's grandmother also taught her how to make biscuits. Uh, that was the very first thing she taught her when she was like five or six or something. So I think that's really sweet, yeah. really sweet. Is she still alive? No, my grandmother passed away in 1996. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sure she's looking down on you and all of your success, and she's very proud. Oh, yeah. What made you specialize in baking? Well, that, and that's the perception that most people, they, they perceive that I'm specialized in baking, but I actually do both worlds. I do baking and savory. It's just that the baking portion of it kind of comes out a little bit more in me because I have a true love for baking and because it is such a science. I mean, it has to be precise or it doesn't work. I mean, it's one of those things that I love to do savory cooking as well, but the smiles that you get from people and the 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 noise that you hear or the noise that you don't hear, let's say it that way, when people's eating the dessert is so rewarding because there is just something about a good, true southern dessert or any dessert for that fact that people absolutely just go crazy over. And so you get a joy. You see you see people have happy moments and everything when they're eating food, period. But when it comes to dessert, you just see their eyes light up. It's like they're a child again. Uh, it may be a cake that takes them back to when they were 16 and it was their birthday cake when they turned sweet 16 or it may be a pie that reminds somebody of their grandmother when they made it. So baking is probably my number one true love, but then I also enjoy the savory side as well. But I just really feel like desserts bring more joy to people and than what savory does. That's a great answer, and I'm going to have to agree with you. It's not like when you're sitting down with your kids or, you know, your parents or whatever, and you think back to, you know, oh, man, remember that one steak that you made me for my whatever it is? No, it's always <laughs> cupcakes or a pie or something. It's always, you're right. It's very nostalgic. Exactly, exactly. I the think, only other thing you ever remember other than dessert is the first time that your mother tries to make you eat Brussels sprouts. That's the only <laughs> story that you can remember other than dessert. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome I, I think it's great that that uh you know part of your love of cooking and baking is you know creating the memory that people will look back on someday i think that's real sweet yes that, that and that's something that i really hold dear yeah now a little birdie told me that you used to be in the flower business f-l-o-w-e-r yes I did. I owned a flower shop and was a florist for almost, well, professionally, 
I was in the floral industry and owned a shop for 17 years and still dabble in it to today. And I have some friends that own, still own the event companies that when I'm not on the road or when I'm not filming anything new and they have something come up, then I'll go and help them uh, do some uh, designing still with flowers. So, but yeah, that was always a true love of mine as well. And I also had my catering business at the same time that I had the flower shop. So I was doing the best of both worlds. I was making people happy with flowers and making them love all the food at the same time. It sounds like you have a true service oriented or servant's heart. I think it's real sweet. Yes, that's a true statement. I've always been that person that I'd rather see somebody else happy before myself because I feel like that, I always felt like that I'm the person that I have to make everybody happy. Be it if somebody is sick and I can't make them something to eat, then I can at least send them flowers. Or if it's somebody that's having a bad day, then I can bake them a cake and take to them. It's all about making others feel as good and happy as I feel every single day of my life. Wow. Well, I'm going to say that you're pretty good at it. Just from what I've seen of you uh, on TV, but also, you know, the fact that you did these things for so many years means that uh, you were successful, so you're good at it. Do you still work at the school? I do not work at the school any longer. Um, as I like to say, I retired with six years, and now I'm on the on television. But I still get to go back. I still go back from time to time and see the kids. I still try to do demos with the kids and teach them about good nutrition. I still go back and see all of my colleagues and stuff. So it just was one of those things that I knew that it wouldn't be right for me to try to do that job and my dream job, which I do now. And I didn't feel like it was fair to my coworkers or the students because I would have to be gone so much. And that way now I can go back as often as I want to in between everything and I get to do more with them than if I was just there working in the kitchen. That makes total sense. What year were you florist of the year, by the way? I was Kentucky Designer of the Year in 19... Or not 19, Lord mercy. I was (laughs) Kentucky Designer of the Year in 2003. I was Kentucky Cup winner in 2000 and. 2009 and 2011 that's impressive so season one of food network's best baker in america must have been wildly successful because here it is eight months later and season two is going to start tonight uh, may 7th at 9 p.m eastern so when you were filming season one did you have any idea of whether it was going to work or if it was going to be... Because, I mean, I know that most people don't while they're in in the middle of it, but did you have an idea that this was kind of a hit for you? You know, while we were filming season one, I always felt like in my heart, even after every episode that we that we done i thought you know what this is going to be something really good we we're bringing something to the network and to the public that really hasn't been done yet they they're getting to see the true like basic art of pastry but with these contestants bringing their creative abilities to that basic design or that basic recipe, and elevating it with flavor. So it was almost an instant thing for me that I felt like this, this was going to be a hit series. But I think that was everything. So, I, And I usually can tell pretty quickly if it's going to be a hit. And I just felt it in my heart that after we had gotten even the first episode done, I thought, you know what, people are going to love this. They're going to love it. And they did. They loved it. It was a very excellent rated show. People watched it. They loved it. And they hated when it went off because it wasn't going to be on every week again. People just got into it so much. And so when we announced the second season was going to be on, people went crazy. They couldn't wait for it. And so I'm really anxious for everybody to see 
the premiere tonight and what all happens and see the reaction because the first season was great, but this season is awesome. I mean, this year we have really pulled some really, really, really hard, stiff talents that they're all very classically trained pastry chefs and they're all very creative. And it's one of those things that you think you always have the perfect cast or the perfect contestants in any season that you're working on. But this season is really, really something. And the the Jason outfits that everybody knows and loves is going to be top-notch this season. They are all kind of based around whatever the challenge is. So if it's chocolate, then my outfit might have chocolate color in it, or it may be chocolate, who knows? So um, it's one of those things that there was a lot of moving parts of this season that we really put in there to even make it better than last year's. So talking about your wardrobe, do do you own all of those clothes, or some of them belong to Food Network? No, I own every single piece of clothing. How I big? Own it all. Listen, I had to build. I know what you're going to say. How big is my closet? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, let me tell you. I have so many outfits now that I actually had to. I actually took one extra bedroom in my house and turned it into nothing but a huge walk-in closet just to house all of my outfits in, which I love. So it's when you walk in this closet, it's like you've walked into Macy's department store because I have it. I'm one of those OCD people. All of my jackets, all my shirts, all my pants, everything has to be color coordinated and they have to line up that way. So everything almost looks like a rainbow because it's one color fading into another color fading into another color. And the shoes is I just, I mean, it's just unbelievable and I love it. So that's one good thing is uh, all the shopping I get to do with my outfits. And uh, and I just, you know, it, it's one of those things I've always enjoyed bright, colorful outfits and something different that nobody else is wearing. And it's just another way that, that people remember who I am by what I'm wearing. And not only just like they, the, when you mention my name, people say, oh, yeah, he's the one that wears the, the really neat outfits. And he has so-and-so sayings about this. And his food always looks good. So, you know, I'm giving them several things to remember me by other than just, he's a great chef or he has wild sayings. So I love my wardrobe. You know, some of it I'm going to probably auction and use uh, the money for charities later on down the road because I can't keep them all forever. But um, yeah, it's fun. That's fantastic. So when they, when they show you on TV, we never really see your shoes. So do your shoes coordinate? Yes. Yes. And that's one thing that even though most of the time you don't see my feet, I have a pair of shoes that actually matches every, either my coat that I'm wearing or it could be a vest or it could be a shirt, but I have shoes that matches all my outfits. You should really get them to show your feet more. <laughs> I don't know how that would be possible. Yeah, but... yeah I, I, I don't know either, but I think we can probably figure it out. <laughs> What's your favorite Southern dish? My favorite Southern dish has to be chicken and dumplings, Chuck beans, deviled eggs, and sweet potatoes. Why? That is a meal that my grandmother always made me for my birthday every single year. Up until the year before she passed away, she was still cooking. And that was what I always, that was just my dream meal. It was all of my favorites into one meal. And that was my birthday dinner every year. Do you make it for yourself for your birthday now? I do. I actually do. Either me, if if I have the time and I'm home on my birthday, then I make it or my mom will make it. So, and my mom says that she's not really a good savory cook. My mom is more dessert cook. So a lot of times she's like, oh, I'm going to cook your birthday dinner. I'm like, no, you can do the dessert. I'll cook my birthday dinner. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that leads me to believe that you're single right now? Oh, yeah. I'm one of those people. I just spread my love around. You know, I'm one of those people. I believe that, of course, I don't live at home. I live on my own farm. But I just feel like that every kid in America and every kid I've had in school is my children. 
and ever adult that I come across is my brother and sister. And I just feel like that, you know, it's just I haven't never found anybody per se that, oh, this is the person I want to settle down with for the rest of my life. I just, you know, I just, I love everybody. Cool. Did you say you live on a farm, your own farm? I do. I live on a farm. How big is your farm? Um, it's actually two, it's one farm, but it's in two different tracks, as, as they call them. And actually where my house sits is like 74 acres. And the other side of the farm is right at 52 acres. And I lease out the uh, flat land of the farm and they run cattle on it. And then where my house is, I actually up kind of up behind the house i actually raised my own chickens just to have those good country eggs how do you have any time to do anything else i mean you have a farm that's fairly working you're traveling all over the place you're still doing events every now and then how do you find the time uh let's just say i have a great support team and a and great neighbors that take care of things when i'm gone <laughs> well that is very important it is it's very important and, and it really is i mean i have great neighbors that i can say okay i'm going to be gone from so and so to so and so and they take care of everything they take care of the chickens they take care of whatever needs to be taken care of but i'm one of those people that i have to have at least 80 to 100 things going on at one time or i'm just bored that's just me i'm always on the go i'm constantly doing something and even on my day off i'm working on recipe development and doing the dish at least four times that i'm developing to make sure it's correct before that i send it off to if i'm doing a recipe for food network or if i'm doing a recipe to go on my website or whatever so i'm always making food constantly at the house and the neighbors love it because i'm like I can't eat all this, so guess what? You all are getting it all. So, And they feel like, that, you know, if I can feed them when I'm home and they're loving it, then the least they can do is, is help me out and feed the chickens when I'm gone. I'll say. Do you have any plans for the Derby? I don't know how far away Grayson is from Louisville, but do you have any Derby plans? Uh, I do have Derby plans, which actually I am in the Pegasus Parade, oh. and I am also on the steamboat during the steamboat race and i'm not sure the rest of the time what will happen i usually help my friend that does derby hats for women that owns a derby hat shop there in louisville and so i'll try to squeeze in maybe making some derby hats in between everything else oh that's awesome my wife and i lived in louisville for about a year and a half and you know being oh, really yeah being from san antonio we have different kind of hats here. We don't, you know, we're more of a, a Hispanic culture hat society, I guess. Yeah. And so when we got to Louisville and during the Derby, hats are a really big deal. Like, they're amazingly beautiful and wildly expensive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so... The, and, they're just as flashy as my clothes, that's for sure. <laughs> that is true. My wife has two of them. Well, one's a fascinator, but also a hat. And... That's not something you're ever going to get rid of until it doesn't work anymore. It's uh, they're beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. We didn't we didn't go to the Derby. We went to the Oaks, I guess. And yeah, it was so much fun. Oh my gosh, it was a blast. So I hope you have a I hope you have oh, a lot of fun. It's one of those things. It's one of those things everybody needs to experience the Derby at least one time. It's not really about the running of the horse. It's all about the outfit, the hat the camaraderie between people just getting to be there that that's the whole experience i agree it's more about the party and less about the the race it's a great party exactly very much so and i would like to give everybody a tip out there who is going to go to the derby if you're a boy steinmart has very affordable seersucker yeah thank you Steinmart has very yeah. affordable yeah. seersucker suits, and if you wait until just after the Derby, they're on super clearance, and then you can get it for next year. So that's a little tip for everybody out there. That's where I got mine. Yep, they're a great place. Really, it's the only place I know of that you can get very nice quality seersucker for, for a good price. Well, if you go after the Derby and you hit the clearance, I got my seersucker suit. The jacket was $15, and the pants were 7 
because it was on clearance. And then, listen, you can't. And I'm a bargain shopper. I know. I know your. I know your feelings. I'm a bargain shopper. I love it. Cool. Good. That's where I get. Uh, I only have a few jackets. Some of them are more colorful than others, but that's where I get them. Is there? Where do you get your wardrobe? Because it's phenomenal. Before you answer, I was in uh, Las Vegas last November, and I was walking through. I guess there's the mall like right across from the airport and I was walking through there and I saw a store that looked like your closet and I took a picture of it and tweeted it at you. And you know, you said, Hey, you're going to have to go there or whatever, but where do you get your clothes? So a funny story is I like to shop. So there is places that when I'm in New York that I have found that carries really wild clothes for men that I'll find sometimes, I'll find jackets in there. And then when I'm in L.A., there is a uh, there's a place called Santee Alley that is a really cool, like, market that's local there. And they have some awesome places in those, in that little, what they call alley, that, that have some really cool jackets for men that's just different that you don't see other places. And then there is one place in Louisville that I actually like to go to that's called the GQ Men's Store that's on 8th and Broadway, I think. is the I know it's on 8th Avenue, but uh, it's on the corner. You can't miss it. It's the GQ Men's Store, and they all know me by name, and they're just one of those people, the places that I can call and say, hey, guys, I've got this event coming up, and this is the kind of look that I'm going for. Do you have anything, or can you order it? And they never disappoint. They always find what I'm looking for. And here recently, there's been a couple jacket designs that I've been wanting, and I couldn't get it done anywhere quick enough to suit me, so I just done them myself. Really? Yeah, I didn't actually sew the jackets. I just take, like, I take like jackets that I'm wanting and the colors, and then I just do the embellishment down to, like, the jewels or the feathers and the design on the coat. Like, I'll do a, a hand-printed design on the coat with different, like, fabric textiles or I use, like, fabric paints and fabric pens and stuff like that and do do my, you know, if it's something that I'm just, I have something in my head and I can't get that design out and you can't find it anywhere, then I just do it myself. That is fascinating. Impressive, man. Good job. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, tonight is the premiere of Season 2 of Food Network's Best Baker in America. And uh, Scott Conant is the host. And then you, Jason Lord Honey Smith, and Marcella Valladolid are the judges, right? And there will also be a rotating third judge. Is that right? That's correct. That is correct. Yes, we have a... Uh... A special judge every week that joins Marcella and I to uh, critique and keep trying to or keep finding the uh, best baker in America. Now, is the whole show shot already? You know, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It just depends. Okay. So when you were on season one, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. When you were on season one, since your background is like, I think the first time that we saw you on the Food Network, you were you were winning. Uh, a similar event, right? A baking championship? Yeah, the first thing that I won was Holiday Baking Championship, and then I won Holiday Baking Kids versus Adults, and then I won Food Network Star. How did you find Food Network or Food Network find you? How did that relationship start? So, funny story, it was a snowy February day, and school was called off because the roads were too bad for the buses to travel on, and it was in February, and we had just I'd just come out of watching the Christmas or the holiday baking from the season four. I had it all taped, and it was it's one of those those shows that I tape and then I just binge watch. And they had just announced the spring baking for that year, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go online and see if I can't find an application. I'd love to just try to be on that show. All they can do is tell me no. So I filled out the application, sent it in. The next day, I got a call from Food Network and said, hey, this is Food Network. We got your application. We really like what we're seeing, all the pictures that you sent us. We really like everything that you've sent us so far, and we would like to uh, do an over-the-phone interview and take it from there and see if see if you're a, a good match for this show. So it went from one thing to another. I had to do a lot of 
sending photos. I had a lot of interviews over several weeks, and then they called me and said, hey, guess what? You're going to be one of the contestants on Holiday Baking Championship, and I was elated. I was actually standing in Walmart checking out, and I looked down at my phone, and I seen it said the number came up of the guy that was talking to me at that time, and I, and I knew the number, and, and I looked at the woman, and I said, okay, this is a very important phone call. I have to take it right now. I can't put it off. Here's my money clip check out the rest of my stuff, pay for it, put the money, whatever's left, back in your pocket. I'll be back in to get my stuff. And she was like, okay, okay. And and this, being from a small town, the woman that I check out with at Walmart all the time, she knew who I was. So I felt safe in, in giving her my stuff. So I went out to my car and took the, I, I answered the phone and I said, hold on just a minute. I'm in the store. I'm going to my car and then we can talk. So I went to my car and and they told me, hey, look, you're going to be uh, one of the contestants on Food Network Star. And I was just like a newborn baby. I just started crying, like, uncontrollably. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm fixing to be on Food Network on the holiday baking, and I'm going through a life change all at the same time because I can't stop crying. <laughs> and so it was really funny. I really thought I was, I'd hit menopause, as we call it. I really thought, oh, my God, I've hit menopause and uh, midlife crisis, and I'm fixing to go on a show, and I can't stop crying. What am I going to do? So it was hilarious. But I got so tied up in that moment, and they were like, okay, we'll call you back to finish up everything. We need you to sign some paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And so I hung up the phone, and instead of going back in and getting my stuff, I have was totally forgot about it and started driving home and then realized halfway home that I didn't even go back in and get what I needed. So I had to drive all the way back. So all started on a snowy February day. And if it had not snowed that day, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at now. How fortuitous. Yeah. I just want everybody listening to dig back into a couple of seconds ago, one of the golden nuggets that he breezed right on by was that a dapper southern gentleman carries a money clip. I sure do. <laughs> Good job. So what can we expect tonight on season two premiere of Food Network's Best Baker in America? So tonight on the premiere of season two of Best Baker in America, it's all about cake. Cake, glorious cake. It's all cake. And this is one of those times that we are making them use vanilla which most people are like, oh, it's vanilla, that's easy. But vanilla can go wrong so quickly, so fast, that people don't realize it. So on tonight's episode, you're going to see some really neat, outstanding cake. You're going to see dramatic, gravity, kind of mind-blowing cakes is what you're going to see. That's awesome. And what can we expect for the season? So the season, I will say, is very, every episode is very exciting. You just don't know what's going to be next. It's like you think you're like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this person's done this or that person's done that. And then it's like, oh, no, wait, wait, no, wait. They have just totally thrown that away and they're starting something new. I mean, it was, it's very setting on the edge of your seat kind of season this year. And the talent. The talent that these contestants have this year is phenomenal. I mean, it is just, it is mind-blowing every time that one of these challenges come up of what these, I call them kids, they're all about my age or younger than me, but that these kids are doing, and they're not kids, but all these contestants that are doing, it's like, oh, you know what? I've never seen this technique before. Why have I never seen this technique? And then you learn that, it's something that they just kind of come up with during their days of pastry school or, you know, it's a little trick that they developed in their restaurant. That, and it's just, it's really going to be fun for the, for even just the home baker this year at sitting at home watching it because the challenges are not those wacky, like off the wall pastries and desserts that people know nothing about. Like, so tonight it's cake. You may have a pie challenge. You could have a strawberry shortcake challenge, a chocolate cake challenge, a cream puff challenge. So it's more geared toward pastries and desserts that people recognize the names and they know the names. So 
I really think that even more people will get into this year's show because it's going to be things that they know, and they kind of know what it should taste like because they've probably eaten them before in their life. So it's going to be exciting, very exciting. Awesome. Now, as we're wrapping up, will you tell everybody what's the name of your website? So the name of my website is southerncountrybling.com. Ah, southerncountrybling.com. Yeah. Got you. And yeah, southerncountrybling.com. And your social media tags? I know that on Twitter you're lowcarb77. Do you have other social media tags? Yes. My Instagram is actually official underscore Chef Jason Smith. Okay. Is there a Facebook? And then my fan page on Facebook is actually Chef Jason Smith dash Lord Honey. <laughs> How appropriate. Reach out to him on social media. He does reply. He does respond. He's been very good about that, I must say. Oh, yes. I replied to every single person that replied that sends me a message or just says, hey, or, you know, I, I feel like that, you know, I keep in touch with everybody that way. Well, it sort of creates a bond, and that doesn't hurt anybody. So, thank you again so much, Jason. Lord Honey Smith, I really appreciate your time. Everybody, check out tonight, uh, May 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern. Check your local listings to find out what channel, but it will be on Food Network, and it is The Best Baker in America, Season 2. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Have a happy derby, man. I'll talk to you later. Hey, guys. If you like what I'm doing... Rate and review the podcast on iTunes and wherever else you're getting the podcast. And if you do order things from Amazon, it would really help me out if you use that Amazon banner that's on the website at fascinationstreetpod.com. And just click through whenever you're buying stuff from Amazon. You can click through the first time and then save that to your favorites uh, or bookmark it. And every time you use it, you don't have to go to the website to get there. I appreciate it, guys. Enjoy. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guests. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.